Welcome back to the channel. How are you guys doing? Today we are going to do things a little bit differently. One of the biggest questions I keep getting on my Instagram messages is how do I fill out these contracts? Where do I find them? What do I do with them? I know a property that needs work. I called the homeowner. What do I do now? Well, now you have to lock it under contract and you do it with a purchase and sales agreement. So when you're dealing with the homeowner, you use a purchase and sales agreement. When you're dealing with the end buyer, you're using an assignment agreement. And we'll deal with the assignment agreement in a later video. Today, we're focusing on the purchase and sales agreement. Um, and you can find these contracts in the description below. Um, I know a lot of other people have contracts everywhere. You can find free ones online. But they kind of all just follow the same terminology. So if you understand this one, you'll most likely understand every other one. Let's start. I think it's best if I just read it and then go back to it and explain it um, rather than stopping its sentences. But let's start off with the first one. So this agreement is made this 24th day of June, uh, 2021. Uh, so this is just an example. You do not have to put this date. You put the date that you're signing this contract. And it doesn't matter the format of the date. Uh, I put 24th day of June, you can put June 24th. The date is not the, the biggest deal. I know some people just want everything perfect and, and they nitpick some of the smaller things and it's fine, it's just a date. Next up, we have between sellers. So these are the homeowners. These are the owners of the actual house. Um, and this can be an LLC, this can be the seller's name, it can be two sellers' names, um, but you just put whoever owns the property, whoever is under it in the deed, that's who you put as the sellers. So if it's under an LLC, put the LLC's name. If it's under two people's name, put both of their names there. All right, let's go over the next one. So, and buyer, so add investment properties, LLC and or assigns, seller agrees to sell and buyer agrees to buy the following described real property together with all improvements fixtures and personal property described below um so this is where you would put your information you can put your name you can put your llc if you do not have an llc that's not an issue you can still put it under your personal name i always recommend that after your first or second deal go and get an llc you can fill an llc out online or you can go to your local accountant um it costs between 300 400 i did mine for 300 i've seen people go as high as 500 i've seen people do it for 150 um, so an LLC is great for tax purposes, liabilities, um, but you do not need one to start. If you want to get one in the beginning, go right on ahead, um, but it's something that you're going to eventually need. All right, next up we have property includes all fixtures. Uh, fixtures are basically built-in built in items. Um, so built-in appliances, draperies, including hardware, shades, blinds, windows, door screening. I mean, this stuff isn't necessarily important. Um, it's just basically if the homeowner tries to, to take toilets and, and I don't know, it's like if the homeowner is just trying to take the floors, take the tiles, take the, the countertops, take the granite, take, these are fixtures that are built into the home. They're considered also property. Um, but this isn't typically something that you would have to deal with. I mean, I've never had to deal with it. I don't know if you guys might, but basically it's saying that. Inclu the property includes all the fixtures. Anything that's built into the home has to stay in the home. So next up, we have street address. So you would just put the address of the property, uh, street, uh, county, block, and lot number. So where do you find your block and lot number? This can honestly be found on your county websites. Uh, you can plug in the address and it gives you the block and lot number. Um, your state's county record site. There's, there's a lot of websites that'll give you the block and lot number. Um, in terms of personal property included, property is sold as is. So it's an as is condition. As you see it is what you're gonna get basically. Uh, for the purchase price, 120,000, but this is the price that you agreed on with the homeowner. This is the price that they're selling it to you for. And now this price is what you're trying to get more for so you can get the difference. So you got it for 120, you're trying to assign it to an investor for like 130, 140, so you can make 10 or 20,000 for your assignment fee. So the lower you can get it, the better you can get more for it. Buyer will pay all closing title costs minus any unpaid taxes, mortgages, or liens. This is a big one because a lot of people ask me, what about the mortgage? What about if they owe anything? So in terms of the owner's mortgage and their liens, that's all up to them. You know, I gave you 120. If you owe 60,000 in your mortgage, the bank during closing is gonna take that 60,000 and you're gonna keep 60,000 in your pocket. If you owe more than 120, now we're talking about a whole nother ball game. Now it's a short sale. Now, now it's now it's different. So typically, you should ask how much the homeowner actually owes on the home. Typically, they want more than what they owe. Most likely, they're not going to take less than what they owe. In terms of this, we pay all the closing costs. We pay all the title fees. The only thing that we don't pay is the owner's unpaid taxes, 
unpaid mortgages, and unpaid liens. This will all be subtracted in the offer price, and whatever is left over, the homeowner keeps. Simple as that. So if you have a lien, it's going to be subtracted from that offer price. If you have a mortgage, it's going to be subtracted from that offer price. If you have a taxes, it's going to be subtracted from that offer price. Whatever's left over, that's what you keep. Anything other than that is none of our business. Next up, uh, the balance due to seller shall be paid as either a wire to the seller's account or a cashier tech after all loans and liens are paid off. So this is basically saying that the seller is going to get his money, his money either in a wire transfer or a cashier's check after all his loans, his liens, and taxes are paid off. So after everything gets paid off, whatever is left over, he's going to get it in a wire transfer or a cashier's check. You know, we don't go around with wads of cash. It's a wire transfer. Literally, in two minutes, you'll get the money right to your bank account. Um, cashier's check is basically just a regular check. He can deposit it in his account and get his money. So when we say cash, it's not real cash. Like, I'm not giving you hundreds of dollars of bills, especially $120,000 of cash. But in a sense, it's not a, it's not finance, it's not a loan, it's just being paid to you, either wire transfer or um, cashier's check. Next up, we have prorations, impounds, and security deposits. Property taxes, insurance, and rents shall be prorated as of the date of closing. All security deposits shall be transferred to buyer at closing. Any shortage in these accounts shall be charged to seller at closing. All right, so this is important when you're dealing with tenant-occupied homes. Um, when there's a tenant involved, they have paid a month, a month and a half of security deposit. And this is kept with the seller. In terms of what we're asking for is the deposits be transferred to the buyer at closing. And any of the shortage of these accounts, so if they don't pay this amount, that it's going to be subtracted basically from the purchase price. So if you have four rental units and they paid you a thousand deposit, four thousand dollars I expect it with the buyer. So the buyer is us, but in technicality, it's who we assign the contract to. So that end buyer wants 4,000 of security deposits for them. And you won't have an issue. Most buyers would give it to you. If they don't, we subtract it from the purchase price. All right, next up, we have closing date and transfer title. So this transaction shall end before or around July 24th, 2021. Closing will be held at Sterling Title Agency, blah, 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 blah. Um, so this is basically saying that we are closing on July 24th. So remember the date was June 24th. So as you can see, we did a month. Now, if you're doing your due diligence period at 60 days, this wouldn't be July. This would be August 24th. So the amount of time that you need to assign the contract. So if you're doing so due diligence period often falls between 30 to 60 days. So when, when from your initial date, you're going to add 30 or 60 days for your closing date, depending on how much due diligence time you are allowed from your from your seller. Um, and closing will be held at Sterling Title Agency. This is a title company that we're going to be using to close the transaction. In terms of the title company, you have to find a assignment friendly title company. So a wholesale friendly title company. And one of the best ways to do this is you join your local Facebook investor group and you ask people for recommendations. You make a post and people will send you recommendations of title companies that are assignment friendly that deal with wholesalers like us. If you can't do that, you just have to Google search title companies, give them a call and ask them if they deal with assignment contracts. If they say yes, then they deal with wholesalers. If they say no, call the next one. So know your title company. That way you can fill out this contract. If you don't have a title company, you can always sign an addendum, which you can change the contract with that addendum. But now you have to get the homeowner to sign again. So better off, get the title company correct the first time and be done with it. Next up, if there are any issues with title, seller will provide time for those issues to be resolved. Seller or sellers agree to transfer a marketable title free and clear of all encumbrances and will pay any required state taxes or stamps. So I guess the best way to understand this is what's what's title. Um, so there's title company, there's title, and there's title search. So the title company is what you're using to close this transaction. You give both of the paperwork, they run a title search. A title search is basically like a background check, like this big old background check on the property. They're looking if the owner is who they say they are, if they're looking the owner actually owns the home, they're looking if there's anyone else that, that has a will under that home, that has, if anyone else is involved in this property that no one else is aware of. So that's what they're doing. They're doing this huge background tech. And the title is basically just like a birth certificate. It's everything about the property. Um, and so all we ask from the seller is that the title is, is free and clear. All we want is that the property is actually owned by you um, you're the only owner or if you have partners, we actually have their information. If there's any 
forgery, if there's any impersonation, if there's any, all of this will become a red flag and kind of halts your transaction. Now the seller has to kind of deal with it. They have to pay their own fees, pay their own taxes to get it all fixed up, and then they can actually sell it to us. But that's basically it. It doesn't really involve us. This is basically something that the seller is going to have to deal with. And hopefully it doesn't happen to you guys because it does kind of let you down and you lose a lose a property basically. Next up, we have damage to the property. So seller shall maintain property in its current condition until closing. So seller has to just keep up with the house and you know not ruin it any more than it probably is already ruined. In terms of this, the only issue that, that I've seen was once where there were tenants involved. It wasn't my deal, but it was another wholesaler where there were tenants involved and the homeowner told the tenants that he's leaving and someone else is gonna deal with them and might evict them. And the tenants kind of got scared and, and thought, well, let me ruin the house if I'm gonna get kicked out. And you guys hear these stories all the time. Um, so the tenants were breaking walls, breaking toilets. And so that's where you would have to renegotiate with the seller and lower the price basically because they just did thousands of dollars of damages. But other than that, the seller just has to keep the house as as is. So 30 days, 60 days, just don't ruin anything, don't break anything. <laughs> All right, next up we have successors and assignees. The terms and condition of this contract shall bind all successors, heirs, administrators, trustees, executors, and assignees of the respective parties. Basically saying that anyone else that's involved is binded with this contract. So whatever we say here, everyone is, is binded by it. So seller shall maintain the property in its current condition. Guess what? Everybody better maintain the, the, the condition of the property. So. Next up, we have access and repairs made by buyer. Seller agrees that buyer have access to the property within 24 hours of signing. Access shall be given during reasonable hours to show the property to others as, a, as such contractors, partners, and such. So this is a good part. So we always like to include this in the contract. Why? So the buyer knows that there's going to be other people involved and there's going to be other people seeing the property. And so these are where our partners, our investors come into play, where they want to go see the property and the buyer has to basically do it it's in the contract now this is the magic part of this entire thing this is what makes wholesaling risk-free this is what makes wholesaling amazing so what we're saying is that this contract is subject to an acceptable inspection period this is our due diligence period and this can be between 30 days 60 days if you can get it to more go right on ahead all right Earnest money deposit. Within five business days after this agreement has been signed by buyer and seller, buyer shall partially perform by delivering an earnest money deposit of blank to escrow for the benefit of seller. Okay, so this is where I get a lot of questions and this is where it kind of gets confusing. Um, for a contract to be valid, you need a transfer of funds. So you need money in order to make this contract valid. You need a deposit. Now, the good thing for us wholesalers is that we can do as little as a dollar. Um, typically, the average is 100, um, and I've seen it up to 1,000. Now, this is all refundable, and I'll explain more in the next paragraph on how we get it back in case that we don't close on this home. Now, with the assignment agreement, this is, the con this is a different contract. Assignment agreement, um, that is non-refundable. This is with your investor, your buyer. It is non-refundable. And it's typically $5,000, $10,000, $3,000. And you get that money. So if they can't close, if they're fooling around, if they couldn't close it, you keep that deposit. In terms of the, in if the homeowner here, if you can't close, you get the money back. So I don't want to confuse you guys by bringing up the assignment agreement, but it is good to know that there are two ways to kind of handle the earnest money deposit. The first way is to put in the money yourself. So you put in that dollar or that hundred dollars yourself and it is refundable. It does come back to you in case that you can't close on this transaction. In terms of the assignment agreement, you can use that non-refundable deposit that you got from your investor for this deposit, right? So you can use their money instead of using your own money. You can use that investor's money when you get the agreement signed to pay off for this deposit. So here's the thing. When, for me personally, I don't send the purchase and sales agreement to title unless I have the assignment contract. I don't want to run a title search yet. I don't want to do anything. I want this all to be paid by the investor. If I go and give this to title right now and I don't have an investor yet, it's all coming out of my pocket. So I wait until I can get both of these contracts and then I send them to title. So I don't pay the deposit just yet. I wait until 
I get both contracts. Again, this is confusing because it has that five business day period. You can change this. You can put it as 30. Um, you can put it for that entire due diligence time. You can put it as 30. Um, and just because you write it as five, and I know it's, it's going to be so counterproductive because I'm saying, I'm saying don't follow the contract. But just because it says five doesn't mean that I'm sending it in five days. So the seller is not really going to be concerned about a dollar in escrow you know that's not his biggest concern that's not you know a hundred dollars a dollar that's not the biggest priority right now and so just because you have five days or you have 30 days that's not the main part of all this the earnest money deposit is held in escrow regardless you don't give the deposit to the homeowner you don't give them cash you don't sell them you don't cash app them you keep it in escrow so it's held in title until closing so either way they're not getting the money so next up this is where where, where it gets important. So why is the earnest money deposit refundable, but I have it written here as non-refundable? Now, there's two ways you can do this. If you want to re-fix up the contract and write refundable, go right on ahead. There's a lot of contracts that say the word refundable. Now, buyers, when they see refundable first thing, they're like, oh, well, you you don't get to lose anything. You can back out in 30 days. But so this is where it gets good. So I know you guys are seeing this non-refundable and I always preach on it being refundable. But listen to this and you'll know why. The earnest money deposit shall be non-refundable to buyer unless seller is unable to deliver clear title to the buyer. Seller fails to execute all documents necessarily to timely close escrow on the sale of the property. Buyer issues timely notice of cancellation under due diligence time frame. So anything else makes this non-refundable. Unless these three things happen, I get my money back. Seller is unable to deliver a clear title. If you can't give me a clear title, I get my money back. Seller fails to execute all documents necessary to timely close on escrow. If you can't give all the documents necessary to close on this for title, I want my refundable back. Just because you couldn't close on time doesn't mean I lose my, my deposit. Third, third one, and the most important one. If I give you a notice of cancellation under that due diligence time frame, that 30 or 60 days, I get my money back. So I have 30 days of a due diligence period. So on the 29th day, I can give the homeowner a call and say, I'm sorry, this just didn't work out. It needed a lot more work than we expected. Uh, we didn't plan accordingly. And unfortunately, it's just not gonna be a right fit for us. And they can't really do much after that. You then send them a termination of contract, a notice of cancellation, whatever you wanna call it. And now one of the biggest questions I get is like, what if they don't sign it? Well, guess what? I let the homeowner be aware within that 30 day period I never sent them the money to them personally because now they would never give it back. It was held in escrow, remember? So I get the money regardless. The contract on my side has been signed and dated, so they really can't do much. Now, let's say that you passed that 30-day period and you forgot about it or lost track of time or whatever the case may be. Unfortunately, you lose your deposit. So you lose that dollar, you lose that $100, um, which shouldn't be that big of a deal. So it'll kind of be a reminder to keep track of these dates. All right, let's finish up these last two sentences. Um, buyer is an investor and is buying the property for profit and utilizing multiple exit strategies such as renting the property, rehabbing the property, and selling the property. I think this is pretty self-explanatory. So this constitutes the entire agreement between the buyer and seller regarding the property and supersedes all prior discussions, negotiations, and agreements, whether oral or written. I think this also is self-explanatory. Anything else that we talked over the phone, anything that we said, Basically, it doesn't mean anything if it's not here. This is written in stone. This is what's binding. This is what we agreed on. So whatever else we talked on the phone, doesn't matter. But typically, try to keep everything constant. You know, don't give him 150 here and put 120 on the contract. But anyways, so then you just make the seller sign. And you sign on the bottom. You date it. And you're all set. You have a property under contract. And you know exactly what every paragraph means. You can answer every question. You understand every aspect of this contract. Next up, next video, we're gonna do the assignment agreement and that's when you're dealing with the investor and how do you assign it to them personally. Hope you guys liked the video. Don't forget to subscribe. I'm trying to teach you guys as much as I possibly can um, and I try to make it as beginner friendly as possible. So bear with me, I'm not the greatest teacher in the world but we're, we're trying, we're trying here. So thank you guys for watching. I'll see you guys in the next video and have a great day.